Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Lockdown Lit Fest event where I am delighted today to introduce to the Lockdown Lit Fest virtual stage the wonderful author Yunus Hassan Khimiri. Yunus is the author of five novels, six plays, and a collection of essays and short stories. Among the many honors he has received are the August Prize, the highest literary award for Swedish literature, the Per Olaf Inquist Literary Prize the Boris Tidning Award for Best Literary Debut Novel, and an Obie Award. His novels have been translated into no fewer than 30 languages, and his six plays have been performed by more than 100 theatrical companies around the world. A resident of Stockholm, Sweden, it is my great honour and privilege to be able to say, Jonas Hassan Imeri, a very warm welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest. First of all, where in the world are we speaking to you from? Are you currently in Stockholm, Jonas? I'm currently on the west coast of Sweden. So I left Stockholm yesterday with my family and now I'm sitting um, like a small cottage that my, according to family legend, my grandfather built this thing by, with his own hands. It's not, we're not really sure that actually happened, but uh, that's part of the legend that he has kind of constructed this small house. So I'm looking out at forests and a wall full of old uh, children's um, paintings. So uh, I've been here every summer, uh, yeah, more or less every summer my whole life. So it's like um, travel back in, back in, in the past in a way. Is it like revisiting your childhood? Yeah, there are so many, like, I sometimes think that, you know, you could think of your, um, what you're seeing, kind of evaluate them, how many memories there are per square centimeters or meters or kilometers. Like, it's a very high density where I'm at right now. Um, both like great memories and more complicated memories, but uh, so that's why I'm sitting. So if there, there is like a sound in the background, that's the Swedish summer rain coming down from <laughs> Swedish liquid sunshine. I'm just going to shut the door in the place that I'm as well because the next door neighbor has a wolf mm. who howls and I can hear howling wolves. Mm. So forgive me for disappearing there for a second mm. or two. Such is the, such is the, uh, the joy of virtual festivals. Uh, mm. We get noises from off from different parts of the country. I'd like to start because you've written so much. You've won so many prizes, as I said in the introduction, about what, where was the seed in Yunus Hassan the young boy that turned him from a reader, from a consumer of stories, I assume, into a writer, somebody who wanted to explore this human dynamic, this human dimension, and most recently in the family clause, the relationships between family members, the politics of family. Mm. What made you decide, actually, I have stories to tell and the means by which to tell them, this is what I want to do? I remember, like, being first struck by this kind of, you know, the kind of magic act of writing, when I realized that I could kind of gra grab onto things by writing about them, and then they would be in some ways um, eternal, you know. Um, speaking, you know, from the house that my grandfather maybe built, or maybe not built, like one of the things that I remember when I started writing was that he had, um, he was quite ill when I was young, he had a body that was slowly kind of, it was not really working well. And one of the things that I remember as a kid, like writing in my own personal diary, like writing about him, writing about the time when he was not ill, um, realizing that there was something magical about, you know, that, that, that I could write myself out of particular circumstances. Um, so it's, for me, it started with like a personal diary when I was seven or eight. And then when I was 15, I remember having this kind of um, writing a lot of short stories where I just like swiped this, the main storyline from like uh, contemporary movies. You know, I would write like a, my version of Boys in the Hood or like my version of Die Hard, you know, just like switching out names and just like trying things out. Um, but uh, then I published my first novel when I was 23, um, which was quite a change in the way because I, I had written very much for my own joy all my life. Um, and it was quite a peculiar 
move from being kind of, you know, um, doing the thing I love the most and all of a sudden realizing that there were readers out there, there were reactions to what, what I was writing. Um, it was an interesting shift. Um, so I published my first novel in 2003. So I've been writing ever since. And what was the part, how, I don't, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with how publishing works in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, here in the UK and yeah. in the States, you get an agent, the agent negotiates with the publisher. Was it the same path to publication? Because usually the trigger point is somebody to whom you present your work, yeah. you see merit in it, and because publishing is an industry, they see the possibilities for making money from it. What, oh, yeah. was, what was your path? Uh, well, we didn't have, at the time, now we have more of a similar system with agents and stuff, but at the time there were no agents, or like maybe a few crime writers had agents. Um, I, was a study, I was studying literature at the time, Right. So I sent my script to the two big um, publishing houses in Stockholm, and I, um, you know, there are levels of reactions. You know, you can get like the impersonal letter, you can get like the personal. <laughs> maybe you want to read something else. Um, I got like the personal letter from both of them, and then um, I really liked the way that one of the editors read me. You know, it it was. It was as he was not really interested in me, but he was interested in what the text could become. Right. And I had a lot of respect for that. So instead of that, would actually, that was actually a book that I wrote before my, my first novel. So instead of making adjustments to that book, I sent him what ultimately became my first novel, Ettagarot um, in Swedish, which is one I read. Um, and then I just remember being like very antsy, you know, walking around. Stockholm waiting for his call, you know, saying yes or no to that script. Um, and then the ultimate joy when he called was just amazing. I still remember his like 00738. Like I remember, you know, the, the, the his phone number with, yeah. that he called from. And there was this, he basically said that they wanted to publish it. And um, it was amazing, an amazing feeling. It's a hell of a feeling for any writer when your first work is accepted by somebody. You know, yeah. Most writers want to find an audience. Yeah. You write in order to communicate your thoughts, your mm. story and so on. And anybody mm. who, who, who opens the gateway to you, opens the doorway to a wider audience, it's a, that's a critical mm. day. Mm. Of course, when you write, first of all, you're writing into a vacuum. You're writing for yourself. You are your first reader. Mm. It, then when you when you are accepted by an agent, accepted by a publisher, becomes a more collaborative experience. Mm. Was the collaboration something you embraced? Um, my normal process is just that I, if I think about the fact that I have readers, I became, I, I'm, I'm not my best self. Like normally what I do in order to get a project going is to block out the world in some sense. And, I'm really grateful for the fact that I have readers, but it's if if I write for something, I find myself being a bit. Um, yeah, it doesn't bring out my most courageous, the most courageous version of who I am, maybe. So I need to block for a period of time. I'm just blocking out everything. I'm writing for myself, and then I have a few trusted readers who, my wife um, is my first reader, uh, who I show my work to, but never before I have something. You know, like a, a real stack of something. Um, um, and then I work closely with editors and agents and, and that kind of thing. But interestingly, like the process, thinking about the process of writing the first book and writing the, the, um, the last book, it's, it's quite similar. This, the, the ultimate joy is being in a world that is not this world. And then all of a sudden realizing that what you're working with takes has life and starts surprising you and that's my kind of that's you know the tingling feeling that the realization that this can actually become something is when you have kind of you know kind of a structured plan for what will happen and then the characters kind of shake their head and say like no no, no i got another plan like we're going to go this way um and then the action of writing becomes quite similar to reading. There is this feeling of being drawn into yeah, uh, an alternative universe, 
So that's that's still my, you know, the fix that I'm looking for when I'm writing. That's very well described. I'd, I'd rather like the imagery of that. There's also this other factor that you think you're writing about something that is very specific. Mm. But there's something weird that happens in the alchemy of authorship when suddenly as you're getting into the stories, you're building the narrative, mm. everything you are, everything you think, everything you see, all the inputs coming in from day to day life play a role in that narrative and somehow have a relevance that can often surprise you. Is, is Has that been the case with you? I can see you nodding at the concept. Well, you know, like, um, the moment when you try to be general, uh, um, you tend to, like, general fiction is very hard to be moved by in some sense. And I, uh, with this particular novel, the, the the last novel, I remember thinking like this this is a thing that I've been thinking about for a long time, like um, kind of the structure of families and how, in some weird way, in a family we're linked together, we love each other, but there's also this kind of weird love hate relationship. Um, and I brought in a lot of influences from my family when writing it, so in a way it was a very um, particular um, personal story um, and uh, I think this is the book that also has um, yeah attracted a lot of more readers than I could have imagined so there's something interesting about that but when, when you go for the specific and you 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 shy away from the general um, uh, it becomes recognizable in some sense. Um, but that was a thing that I was working with quite a lot in the book, you know, trying to understand um, why this family mattered so much to me. Because ultimately, we spend 10 days in the life of a family where um, on the surface, like, not a lot of things happen. A lot of things happen. There's like yes. 10 intense days where, like, these relationships between particularly like the main, three main characters are kind of, yeah, um, tussled around quite a bit. Um, but um, I think in the family, oftentimes like small things are charged by historic events. And I think that's the case in this family as well. You know, like all the small critiques or the small um, deviations or the small frictions, they're actually tarnished by a past of like, one parent who has left the kids or like, um, yeah, like, um, it's almost like nothing in every day could be removed from its painful history. Yeah. And that's a theme that keeps coming back in the book. Um, so that was a theme that I wanted to explore as well. You explored it very well. I mean, it's, it, it's a great summary of, of, um, of how everything comes from something. Nothing comes out of nothing. Mm. The one, let's, so let's talk about The Family Clause. This latest book is published in the UK by Harville Secker. It's translated by Alice Menzies. There is a wonderful quote from Nikita Lalwani, who has written of it, a beautiful study of familial need and mess, in which the universal and the particular play footsie with each other. Deft, artful, but above all insightful till it hurts. This is Khmeri's best yet. So can I ask you, Quite often, I'm aware, one sets out to write a book, and the book you have written is not quite the book you set out to write. So what was it you were setting out to write when you started with the first word of the first sentence of the first paragraph of the mm. family clause? What was the voyage you were hoping to embark on? I think one of the starting points was me wanting to write my version of a specific family's past you know like this now i'm going to tell my how it was for me you know okay um, um but weird enough what what when the book kind of took off it started off with um me writing about this um on the circus around like three main characters the son the father and the sister um and i started writing about the father the father comes back it started off with this particular, like the first sentence of the book, where, where he claims to come back to a country that he's never left. You know, he, he claims to have never, having never left, but actually this, he's coming back to this country. And we're in a world where, um, 
that world in initially was so um, um, it was such a joy to write him because he is so sure of himself. You know, people who are just like going around finding faults in everyone else, but not seeing any that they have made any any mistakes themselves. So there was this joy and this kind of almost um, yeah, uh, almost like a fireworky feeling of just having this uh, being in his inside his head. And then after after a while, I realized that this person. It, in order to be that person, you know, who finds, sees wrong in everyone else except in himself, you're actually very lonely. And it's a very, it's a very heavy body to be in, um, because we know the father, he's losing his eyesight, he's coming back um, in order to get help, you know, to get an eye operation to, to um, yeah, he needs help by his kids. And the problem is that this father, he has actually, he has not been the the best father. So the kids who have helped him for many years, especially the son has kind of, the son has this kind of a, quite a mathematical brain. So he has kind of added up the years that the father took care of this him. And that, then he added up the years that he has taken care of the father. And he has kind of come to the conclusion that they are even. I'm not going to take care of you any longer because I've, I have done that at the same time that you took care of me. And that's what sets off things. That the, the, ultimately, the son says, I want to change. This family can't, we can't go on as we have gone on for like 10, 15, 20 years. We have to change. And when someone in a family says we have to change, then, of course, like everyone has to adapt and a lot of things happen. Um, so it was an interesting process because I, I think I started out um, writing about the father and then not, even though it wasn't my, uh, what I was hoping for, I think I slowly started to understand him more and more the more I wrote and especially understanding kind of how painful it is to regret having left a child. Because that's the main pain of the father. Like, we all have regrets. We all have things that we wish we did, you know, differently, or things that we w wish that we hadn't said, or whatever. But he has left a child, and that child has died. So he walks around with the pain of thinking that like, maybe I could have made something. Maybe I could have done something differently. Um, and since this is a book, that daughter who is dead. Uh, reappears, comes back in a way in the book. Um, and that was also something that I was, I was interested in kind of seeing what she would say, you know, having been left, would she come back like being all vengeful and rage, full of rage? Or would she be, strange thing is that she came back and she was almost forgiving. She's almost the one person in the book, even though, she has no physical body. She is the one who is capable of kind of forgiving him. Not saying that he was a great dad, but saying more like, you tried. The end result was not great, but at least you tried. Um, and there's a kind of a redemptive power in that as well, to be able to forgive, to be able to say that, um, I saw your, I saw that you did your best with what you had. I think that's what the daughter ends up saying. Yeah. Yes. My reading of this, it read as a deeply personal novel. Mm. I understand it's fiction, of course. But the way I read it, was I say, was deeply personal. The way you're talking about it is deeply personal. Yeah. How much of this is fiction? How much of this is you drawing down on your own experience? How much of it is the power of your imagination? Can you tease that apart? So it's always so tricky to to label it, you know, in, in percent, you know, like how much of it is is. Uh, but I I must say that this is I think this is my most personal book so far. Uh, it was definitely the book that I was most afraid of writing. Um, it was one of those books where how should I put it without like. Um, 
you know, in every family, there are these things that you don't talk about. You mm -hmm. know, there are things that we don't mention it. It's part of our history, but we choose not to talk about it. Will we? Um, and one of those things in my family's history was that my father had a child, um, you know, pre in a previous with um, in a previous relationship. Who she was older than I, and she was not. I remember as a kid thinking that it was weird that the moment she came to visit us, she was part of us. You know, yeah. she became like intimately like my sister came to visit. And she, I remember thinking it was also weird because she looked, we were quite physically similar in a way. And I adored her, you know, she was my biggest sister. And then when she left, she was kind of encircled by a certain silence. So she was part of the family, but at the same time not because she was, you know, someone that you know, lived a little bit in between us and the outside world. So I think that was one of the starting points. Um, this novel, trying to investigate how um, what it feels like to be both inside and outside a family at the same time. Um, and you know, I'm 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 the father of of two kids now. I think another thing was just like. I was on paternal leave with my second kid when I was writing this book, uh, when I started writing it. And I thought a lot about, like, what does it mean to be a good parent? Mm. You know, what, what is a good parent? Is a good parent someone who is always, like, 100% present? Then I'm a terrible parent because I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I, may, I may be physically present, but I'm always, like, thinking of other things or I'm just, like, what does it mean? Um, and I remember thinking to myself, like, that would be, um, it would be really terrible to realize too late that I messed this up. You know, what would I do if I, in my 60s, I would realize that I was, I was kind of crappy dad. One way would be, you know, to jump into my time machine and go back into time, which is a tricky thing. Uh, but the other thing m might be to kind of, maybe I could kind of heal by taking care of my kids kids would that be an alternative to take care of the grandkids um and something similar happens here like the father has made some choices that he regrets and he can't go back in time and that's a very painful experience but at least for a few hours <laughs> he takes care of the grandkids and and um, i think there is some healing there i think he realizes that um the shadow of someone who has left the family, like someone leaving a family, that's that's a that's a big shadow that influences everyone in that family. And I don't think he really understood that until um, he experienced it himself. Yep, I, I agree with all of that. It's not without humor. There are fantastic humorous moments in this which shine like little diamonds in this beautiful language, the beautiful use of language that you have. Thank you. The writer that you are. And I have to pay tribute, I assume, to, of course, to Alice Menzies, who I don't read Swedish, but I understand that she found this a joy to work on because of the beauty of the language that you have constructed. But can I ask where the humour came from? Because you are, you, you are not unaware of the humour. For all these are very serious issues you deal with. Mm. A very profound relationship issues, family issues, humane issues. Who mm. are we? What is our role? What are our responsibilities? How do we cope when we fail in those responsibilities? Can we wind the clock back? No, of course we can't. Mm. How easy or difficult? Did the, the long-winded question I'm asking is: Was did the humour come naturally? Did it surprise you, or did you engineer that in? Mm. It came naturally because, like, being part of a family is also like. You can't turn your back to the, 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 the weird. I remember at one point I just started playing around with the fact that I just started playing around with writing down one day of paternal leave, you know, like with two kids and kind of the craziness of it, and just like trying to keep them alive, you know. Um, and it went from being uh, the first impulse was just like writing down because we had two kids who were adorable, but they had this particular thing that they never slept like 
never, ever. Um, so we were slowly going crazy and I started writing down like just a normal day with them and the intensity of it. Um, and it was interesting because this was, um, it went from being quite a dull experience be because there is this kind of monotony of being a parent and uh, to being quite an intense, almost like an action, a very action, intense experience when you started writing down all these small menu details and everything. Um, so I think uh, the humor came naturally and it was, um, it was also a joy to, to, to jump into the heads of these particular family members because we spent some time in the three main characters is the sister, the father, and the son, but then we spent some time in the one the one year old's head and in the the five year olds so four four year olds uh, kids' head. Um that was also a certain joy to kind of to see the adults with the kids uh perspective. Um I had a I had a good time. Uh, doing that um, but it's it's not something I never do anything I never plan for humor to appear but it's more I think it's more uh, my way of trying to be honest with things if you know if that makes sense do you know what I mean like this I do even at a funeral there are some crazy uncle cracking jokes that kind of thing um, right there's a lovely scene that I'm thinking of which is the four-year-old starts crying, the one-year-old then starts to cry because the four-year-old starts crying, and then a blue bus appears, a bendy bus appears, and the father has the urge to let go of the buggy, jump onto the bus, and just disappear. Yeah. One of your reviewers said, what parent hasn't had that fantasy <laughs> of just running away from it all? I think we all, like all parents, have had that fantasy. I think this particular, for this particular son in the book, I don't think fantasies aren't dangerous. Like we have weird minds, like we imagine weird things. But the moment when you forbid something, the moment when you tell yourself like, I'm able, like I'm gonna be the perfect parent. I will never dream about leaving these kids. I, then that thought become very, very um, charged. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't allow himself to think, just let me go. Let me. So he, like his mantra is just like, whatever I do, I will never leave my kids. Um, and then ultimately that, I'm not going to spoil anything, but that, that's for someone who has a mantra, you know, yes. I'm, not, I'm never going to leave. Well, one can figure out that, that that's one of the things that he, yeah. that I won't eat the donut. I won't eat the donut. Oh my God, exactly. I've, I've eaten the donut. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have a hell of a following, Yunus. You've won a lot of prizes. Let's deal with the prizes first of all. What do they mean to you as a writer? What do they represent to you? Mm, writing time, I think. You know, like um, a prize means like I could, mm, I have more time to fail in some ways. Um, a prize means, of course, the recognition and the honor. Um, it means. Uh, fear of not being able to write something again. It means um, getting readers who weren't familiar with my work before. Um, but ultimately, it means time, I think. Like for every time, for, if I have won a prize, my first thing has been kind of to translate the, the prize or the money into, okay, so how long am I going to be able to write on this, uh, write my, my next work? Um, they have a very real world application. The audience, a very loyal audience that you have gained, is that a, a joy and a responsibility? Is it a big responsibility? Yeah, I, um, it's an amazing feel, feeling to have people to are kind of waiting for, for your next work. Um, I'm, uh, yeah. Um, Normally, my life is kind of quite uh, structured in the way that I have like writing time when I'm not very visible, and then I have more like reading time when I go around reading readings and stuff. But um, it's, um, yeah, it's it's 
it's lovely to have them um, to be, yeah. But I think I need the idea of a vacuum to continue writing in some ways. There's one last thing I'd like to talk about with regard to the family clause, which is very conscientiously, you do not name any of the members of the family. Can you yeah. explain why you chose to do that and what that means? Yeah. Well, ultimately, a name is something that is fixed, right? My name is always my name. Um, and these characters, they didn't want names. Like, the, they are actually continuously, we understand whose head we're in because of their relationship to the other people in the mm-hmm. family. Um, but that is also kind of, it's quite fluid, you know, like the sister who is a mother, she doesn't have any relationship to her son at the moment. So is she still a mother? And she's contemplating whether or not to, she's pregnant, should, should she keep the baby or not? So um, I think they don't have names because these people are kind of continuously being who they are in relationship to the other people in the family. Um, that's kind of the theoretical way of answering it. You know, the, the kind of more honest way is just like, I tried giving them names and they were just like refusing. <laughs> You know, they were just like, that's not my name. Um, and I, I'm not ready to have a name yet. Um, for me, that's always a sign that, that's always a good sign. Like w- when the characters take on agency and kind of refuse things. Um, so. Um, I like both answers. They both have an honesty that, that resonates. Thank you. Um, it strike there are some fantastic set pieces in this, and as I mentioned in the introduction, um, your six plays have been performed all around the world. It strikes me there's a lot of stagecraft in this novel, and I wonder whether you have an eye towards adaptation for the stage for this. Uh, no, not really. No, I. Um, um, I've been asked from time to time to make adaptions of my own work to other medias. And it's, I've always had this feeling of, um, I think it would be quite similar to translating yourself. Yeah, quite. And I think it would be easier for me to translate you than to translate my own words because I have picked them in Swedish and you need someone else to bring their vision to it and almost like kind of collide their vision, you know, almost like being quite rough to the original um, piece. So I, I, have, yeah, I have never done that, actually. Um, some of my books have been adapted into movies and into plays, yeah. but I have never been the person doing that. Um, and also still, you know, like we talked about in the beginning, like the writing process for me has always been linked to joy. I'm not yeah. saying that it is easy. It's the most <laughs> difficult thing I know. You know, it's the, the most difficult thing I know. But it's also when it works, it's, it's something, uh, nothing brings me more joy than, than uh, writing. So for me to go back to an earlier piece and rewrite it and revisit it and tinker with it, it's, it wouldn't bring me enough energy. So I couldn't do that. I understand that. Let's come back to final question, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, where we started with your path to publication and collaboration. Mm. Obviously, as I said, I've read the English translation translated by Alice Menzies. How mm. how collaborative are you, or do you like to be, or would you, would you like to be with your translators? Your obviously mm. your English is impeccable. I'm mm. guessing there were many conversations you had with Alice, or I may be wrong. How how did that work? She she's just an amazing translator, and I, I, I all my translations I have like. Um, or community of them, or like there, there's what I do normally is like I have a, I'm always available to answer specific questions. Uh, I I don't think um, it's my job to be. I think they will make a better job if they feel like I trust them, which, which I totally do. In practical terms, what I do for every new translation, I answer specific questions, and then I have like a slowly growing like Word document with all the er- earlier questions. So whenever there's a new translation, they get like a a batch of the earlier already. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Um, but it's uh, no, it's a complete joy to be, you know, to be in contact with them, and also to. It's it's also 
interesting. That's such a sign of a good translator when you realize the level of um, how deep they are into the text. You know, I remember get, getting one email from a German translator where she was just like, she really wanted to know um, in a novel called Everything I Don't Remember, the width of a gravel road, because apparently in German, German, like that's different. So she, I, if I remember correctly, I think she even like sent different photos of, is it like this kind of gravel road or is it more like this or is it? Right. And that kind of thing to realize that something, a word that felt right to me, yes. ends up with her, you know, image Googling gravel roads in German. It's because quite- is, is it a road? Is it a track? Is it a lane? Is it a, which word is, it, is applicable? Yeah. That's and it's fascinating. A lovely experience. Yeah. Eunice, what can you tell us about what you're working on now? Obviously you have teased apart families, and it's, you know, an addictive novel. It's an incredible novel. It's intense and it's complex and it's beautiful. Thank you. How do you move on to that, onto the new idea? And have you had an idea for that, that you're teasing apart now? What can you tell us of what we can expect from the pen of Yunus Hassan Kamiri in the future? Well, I wish to be able to say that this spring has been like a creative. <laughs> it's, it's been a very weird spring um, because... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've been working on something, but I also, uh, earlier this spring, we had the, for the longest time I've been dreaming of going to New York to make a research thing. And there's this fellowship, it's called the Cullman Fellowship at New York Public Library. And in February, we got, I, I got it. So we were kind of jumping around in the kitchen, me and my wife, like drinking rosé bubbles and just being like celebrating. And then some things happened, you know, so we, we kind of, we planned the move to New York with our kids and then, you know, the world collapsed. So it's been, um, ultimately, we're not really sure what will happen in the fall. Um, but there has been a lot of Googling, unnecessary Googling. This <laughs> Nothing unnecessary. I have a thing that I keep, I have an idea that, uh, I won't let go, and that's normally a good sign. So I'm, I, I will try to explore that this fall. We look forward to that. And good luck. Congrat congratulations on the Cullen Fellowship. That's Thank you so much. Very impressive. Well done. I've had other friends who have had that. They've had the most extraordinary time. And to be so profoundly attached to the New York Public Library, which is such a fantastic institution. Yeah. Congratulations Thank to you. Thank you. They just need to open it so we can go. <laughs> they just need to open it. They just need to fly you there. Exactly. Last thing from me. Is there any message you'd like to give to your readers in English or indeed in any other language who might be watching this? Would you like to impart some wisdom or knowledge or hope for them in these rather difficult times? I've, I've just, we have had like a month in our family, we've just been saying like this too shall pass, you know, whenever we have been like in a word, because it's just like politically and uh, yeah, everything seems quite. Uh, I think I never realized before how stressful uncertainty is and you know how closely the, gra the grasping mind is like can't live in uncertainty it does everything it can to grasp things so we've just had that almost like a joking saying almost like in a jokingly way to each other it just, it's it feels like it's it's never going to but this too shall pass so let's hope let's hope that it it passes soon indeed amen to that Eunice. Eunice, thank you so much for joining us here at the Lockdown Lit Fest. It's been such a real privilege and joy to talk to you. Thank you. And I'm a huge fan of the Family Clause. I'm now obviously going to go back through most of the rest of your writing and find all the English translations. And mm -hmm. congratulations to Alice Menz is on a fantastic translation. Eunice, thank you so much. Thank you. You've been listening to me speak to Eunice Hassan Kamiri about his latest work, entitled The Family Clause, published by uh, Vintage, um, part of Harvill and Secker. It is the most extraordinary work. Um, there are a number of fantastic reviews, one of which by Boris Tildling. How do I say that? Sorry, Boris Tildling? Tildling? I don't know. I, I haven't seen that one. But uh, Bo Boris Tildling, I think, is how we're going to say it, uh, mm -hmm. who writes, a rich tale characterized by moments of real pain and flowing beautiful language, a writer who should not be missed. Whereas M Magazine wrote, 
a tender, shimmering novel that moves effortlessly, yet reaches so far that covers betrayal, loyalty, and unwritten rules. It is a pure vitamin shot for its readers. For those of you that haven't yet discovered in English translation Jonas Hassan Kamira's works, it's a real joy, and I cannot praise it highly enough. Jonas, thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to you too for being such keen supporters of the Lockdown Lit Fest and all we're endeavouring to do. May I point you towards the Patreon page where we are willing to accept some small funds uh, to keep us going. We're all working for free. We're working pro bono to do this. and We're working hard to provide you with little windows into the output of publishing, not only from the UK, but from around the world as we grow and improve. Thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us as ever. We hope you're keeping well. We hope you keep safe and please stay careful. Cheerio.